Hey everyone, in a moment I'm going to show up on this camera in a totally different outfit with a totally different background because I can't stay in one place for several weeks at a time. Um, but during this episode you're going to watch me come to the realization that I recommend a lot of Slytherin games, like at least one a month. And it's because I like turn-based strategy games and they're about the only publisher I know that's solely dedicated to delivering independent turn-based strategy games. So after I came to that realization, I wrote them and said, hey, I think it's awesome. I love what you guys do. Uh, please keep fighting the good fight. And they wrote me back and said, hey, we love extra credits. Do you want to hop on Skype sometime? And we chatted for a bit. And they offered to help give games to the Games for Good initiative to get games out to teachers. Um, and they also happened to mention uh, that they're going to have a humble bundle the very week that I was going to release this episode. Uh, I was going to say the very day, but it's actually the day before, so we'll release this the day early. Uh, so I'm not saying they're good, right? You know all the caveats that come with James Recommends, with games you might not have tried. But if any of those games have interested you, if you're kind of curious to dive into some of these esoteric, arcane, turn-based strategy experiences that Slytherin releases, uh, you're probably never going to find the catalog cheaper than you are this week. So hop over to Humble Bundle. I think we're going to put the link below right here. And uh, yeah, you can check out some of what I've been talking about as far as I'll go with interesting design. All right, I'm going to leave it to me to talk about Pacific. Hello, YouTubes. Welcome back to James Recommends. So this week I'm going to recommend a game called Order of Battle Pacific. It's made by the same people who make Warhammer 40k Armageddon and way back made Panzer Corps. And I was looking over the list of James Recommends and I realized that probably about once every six weeks I recommend a game by Slytherin. I like turn-based strategy games. They're about the only people just pumping out turn-based strategy games and they do a lot of them well and do interesting things with them and uh, nobody's ever heard of any of the games made by Slytherin so they fit this show and are easy for me to do but if I'm doing too much turn-based strategy stuff feel free to just flood the comment thread and tell me stop like we don't need any more turn-based strategy games for a while I don't know if I will be able to find as many non-turn-based strategy ones I don't promise I will listen to you but I will definitely keep it in mind. Uh, so anyway, and yes, I actually go refresh their games page to check when they've released new things, which is why this game, I think, can't, comes out, well, maybe this will be late. Maybe this will come out later. It came out yesterday for when I'm recording this. Uh, and it's awesome, because what it is, is same general, you know the deal, turn-based strategy, hex-based, Panzer Corps, Warhammer 40k Armageddon style game. You got that. Uh, what's really interesting is that it's set in the Pacific. Think about for a moment how few games that we set in World War II are actually set in the Pacific. We almost universally focus on the war in Europe and in Russia and in North Africa. We never, we never really play the war in the Pacific. And I mean, it was as big of a theater, it was a bigger theater actually, and there's so much that was so vital going on there. And yet, from a game creator's perspective, there's all sorts of problems that come with uh, dealing with the war in the Pacific. So I wanted to talk about how Order of Battle Pacific answers some of these problems. Specifically, the one that comes up Every time, and there's a lot more, right? Dealing with the size of ships compared to uh, the unit action and dealing with infantry action compared to naval battle, all this stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff dealing with the Pacific that makes it uh, harder to represent. But the one I wanted to talk about today is whenever you're building a war in the Pacific game, especially if you have a campaign, especially if you have a US campaign, you almost universally have to start at Pearl Harbor. The problem is Pearl Harbor, it's very difficult to make Pearl Harbor engaging for the player, especially in a way that's not just horribly depressing, uh, if you're playing on the American side. And so I really loved how they dealt with this problem, because it's even more difficult 
to deal with in sort of a, this isn't quite a grand strategy game, but in a larger than tactical game, right? In a turn-based strategy game. So what they do is you're playing your, your commander level guy, but when this all starts out, all you've got, you've, you've commandeered a medical truck, right? And you're riding with a medical team to raise the alarm. And you've got like one boat that you're in charge of out there. And then all the rest of the US fleet is commanded by the AI. So the AI is playing two sides. The AI is playing the Japanese attack wing and is playing the US fleet. And you're playing just this one little medical truck. But as you go to the air bases and the military bases and the fields to raise the alarm, at, at some of the places you'll, you'll raise some anti-aircraft units, at some you'll scramble fighters, right? And it'll even give you a message about how, how some brave and lucky, if you got some craft off the ground or flying to intercept and you get to start controlling those and so it's great tutorial right because it teaches you all the basics moving using units on a small scale you don't need all the massive numbers of units that were involved in that because that's not what you're playing at the same time it makes you feel really positive about what you're doing as a player and makes it engaging because you're trying to to raise the alarm right you're you're Paul Revere and uh, each of these actions feel heroic because You've got a few few fighters off the ground. Go send them in. Try and save those ships that you're not even playing, right? And one of the objectives is to keep these ships alive that you have no control over with the few units you can scramble. Uh, and so it introduces you to air combat, introduces you to anti-aircraft, how defensive fire works. It introduces you all this stuff in a simple way. Makes it feel really engaging for you, but also gives a personalized story and makes you feel some of the sense of loss and how the struggle that this was, at least on the American side, I haven't gotten to play the Japanese campaign, um, but it makes you feel, feel every life, right? It makes you feel every uh, fighter that, that goes down. It makes you feel how, how small and that huge this event was. And that's an incredible thing. That's a very powerful thing. And it's a very bold design decision, right? To instead of let you play the game the way you will normally play it throughout the rest of the game where you're commanding a huge force and the entire force is yours and you can buy new units and select your units and all that and you're trying to take objectives. Uh, instead, it introduces you with, with something that's a narrative that comes out of the play itself by simply limiting you to that one medical vehicle and giving you the objective of raising troops, raising the alarm at the various bases and airfields. So really interesting answer that not universally applicable, but really interesting answer and sort of a way to change our thinking about how we approach an aspect of history that in games we've had a very, very hard time representing. So with that, this week, James recommends Order of Battle Pacific. See you all next week.